Welcome. Uh, I'm Alex Shepard. I'm a staff writer at The New Republic. Uh, I'm pleased uh, today to be joined by three of the most uh, interesting and thoughtful uh, critics and thinkers about uh, film morphing today. Uh, Joe Livingston, my colleague at The New Republic. Uh, Miriam Bale, the artistic director of the Memphis, uh, the Indie Me uh, Memphis Film Festival, and Adam Naiman, uh, a film critic uh, most regularly at The Ringer and the author of several books on film. Most recently, uh, Masterworks, uh, the films of Paul Thomas Anderson, which we'll be discussing today. Uh, we thought that we would start our conversation by taking a look at a clip from the master uh, and then having a short discussion about it. Starting now, we're not to blink. If you blink, we go back to the start. Do you often think about how inconsequential you are? No. Do you believe that God will save you from your own ridiculousness? No. Have you ever had intercourse with someone inside your family? Yes. Have you ever had intercourse with someone inside your family? Yes. Who? My auntie. Have you killed anyone? No. Maybe. Not me. Have you killed anyone? No. How many times did you have intercourse with your aunt? Three times. Where's your aunt now? I don't know. Would you like to have intercourse with her again? No. Do you regret this? No. Where's your mother? I don't know, Looney God. Infringement. <laughs> Back to the start. Okay. Do you often think about how inconsequential you are? Yes. Do you believe that God will save you? No. Have you ever had sex with a member of your family? Yes. Are you lying? No. Who? My Auntie Bertha. Where's your aunt now? I don't know, maybe home. Are you lying? No. Are you a liar? Yes. Have you killed anyone? Yes. Who? Japs in a war. Do you regret this? No. What are you running from? Maybe hurt a man, I think. Maybe he's dead, I don't know. Where? And Salinas, he stole a batch of my booze and he drank it. Does this booze you make poison? No, if you drink it, smart. Are you trying to poison me? Mm, no. Where's your father? I'm dead. How did he die? Drunk. Where's your mother? Where's your mother? Looney bit. Is she psychotic? Yes. What is the name of your aunt? Bertha. How did you come to have sex with your auntie Bertha? I was drunk and she looked good. And you did it again and again? Yes. Have you ever had bad thoughts about Master Peggy? Yes. What did you think? I thought you were fools. Am I a fool to you? No, sir. If you were locked in a room for the rest of your life, who would be in there with you? Doris. Who's Doris? Best girl ever met girl I'm going to marry one day. Is she in Lynn? Yes. Lynn, Massachusetts? Yes, sir. And why aren't you with her? Uh, no, I'm an idiot. Why aren't you with that lovely girl? I got no reason. I'm a fool. Do you love Doris? Yes. Is she the love of your life? Yes, so sir. Why aren't you with her? I don't know. Yes, you do. Tell me why you're not with her if you love her so much. I told her I'd come back, and I never went back, and now I just, I gotta get back to her. Why don't you go back? I don't know. Why don't you go back? I don't back? know! Close your eyes. Okay. Uh, my first question is, Adam, do you know how inconsequential you are? Uh, uh, <laughs> all the time, every day, twice a day, seven days a week. Yeah, I do. Uh, that is one of the most intense uh, scenes in a sort of oeuvre of very intense scenes. Uh, I was wondering, you know, it marks in some ways the um, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's uh, as you write in the book, his, his sort of uh, kind of artistic high point. Uh, why did you want to send, uh, why did you want to start by watching this clip? Well, I mean, when we were talking about picking clips, there's a lot of places that you can go. Part of it is personal preference because it's a film that 
means a lot to me that I think is very good and that I tried very hard to get right in writing about it. But the pure kind of actor's dual nature of it synced to the kind of contest of wills between the characters, the different kind of long take where earlier in his career, you might've had a long take that's really sort of muscular and, and based on camera movement or duration, but here it's kind of shrunk to the size of the actor, the way that he uses faces as landscapes in that particular movie. I mean, Phoenix's face is like a universe kind of unto itself there. And just that idea of not blinking and that idea of not only is it a long take, but like the blink serves to some extent as a kind of cut and then it cuts back to a subjective memory. It's just really kind of wonderful, concise, but also very spacious filmmaking. And uh, it's just one of those scenes that the very first time I watched the movie kind of locked into and thought, this is a filmmaker who's talented and, and who I've admired before, but he's on a, he's on a, a new wavelength here for me. And that's always how I'll regard the master as the first time I thought that this guy was a really amazing, amazing filmmaker. Yeah, the, the idea of virtuosity in Anderson's work is there from the very beginning. It was one of the things when I was rewatching Boogie Nights that uh, stood out to me was just how the movie is in some ways less a coherent product than just a series of these, uh, you know, almost look at me shots. And yet uh, slowly, and I think, as you argue, I think quite convincingly in the book around Punch Drunk Love, there's this transition into a much more uh, subjective kind of filmmaking, even though these themes of virtuosity very much remain. Well, yeah, I mean, talent is one of the subjects of Boogie Nights, right? And there's like inexperienced talent and then kind of a more experienced group of artisans and, and filmmakers who sort of inaugurate this, this younger guy into it and the nature of talent or the nature of stardom in that movie is obviously slanted by the fact that it takes place in the porn industry but like you could argue that that idea of potency and talent is kind of the subject of boogie nights and it doesn't disappear in the work but it becomes sublimated to being about other things like history and psychology and these kind of cults of personality you know th th throughout american life but virtuosity never disappears i would just argue that in some ways it becomes more impressive by becoming subtler in in places yeah i mean i was i was gonna see how long i could go without mentioning uh anderson's phallic fixation i guess but but in that sense uh thinking about boogie nights where there's very clearly this sort of metaphor almost of, uh, uh, of Dirk Tickler's magnificent uh, penis and then slowly this becomes I mean obviously it, it has no choice but to become more more well, subtle in the work. I but. should I want to I want to give credit where it's due and maybe set her up to talk about it which is that this is something that Miriam tweeted about and unfortunately we didn't get a chance to write about a few years ago even before the the erection of the House of Woodcock in <laughs> Phantom Thread this was a motif in the work that I think was there for all to see, but something Miriam was sort of smart about. And it's to my regret that it's not cited as such because it's a good point. And it's a point that you can take in a lot of different directions. But one of the reasons I ask different people to be on this panel or, or we ask people is I kind of want to hear what they think about those aspects of the work. So if I can ask Miriam to talk on that point, that might be, uh, it might be appropriate as, it, as conceptually it's right in her wheelhouse. Um, yeah, well, it's so big. Um, and I think it's interesting because you mention it in your intro, um, yet where you go with it is not necessarily where I, I would go with it. Like, you know, it's something that I became very aware of. Um, I think around the time of Inherent Vice, I pitched some articles about how Paul, Tam Paul Thomas Anderson's career was about the evolution of the boner um, from obviously Dirk Diggler to um, uh, the Taming the Cock and the and, um, Magnolia. Um, and then, but I, in preparing for this talk, I was wondering exactly what, why I, why I realized that at an inherent vice, because it's not as obvious in that. And I think that, I mean, and then it became very obvious in that clip that you cite, I mean, that quote in your book when um, Paul Thomas Anderson and Daniel Day-Lewis are gleefully coming up with the name Woodcock as if they were like 15 year old boys, 13 year old boys. And that's what I'm kind of interested in him is that adolescent boyness that is always there in different forms, but that 
is, um, I think my interest in it, Adam, is different than yours because you took it to an interesting place as far as um, looking at it, you know, um, the autourism and deciding to kind of have a slightly anti-autourist or looking through autourism and the sort of the sort of dickness of <laughs> our culture, if you want well, to say well, that. <laughs> Well, I, I, I led with a line in there by a very contentious film critic, Armin White, who's really wrote a kind of landmark piece on Anderson negatively at the beginning, which was called the Magnolia Syndrome, which this, the, the main point of which was that Magnolia is not as good as shortcuts. But what was underneath that, and he developed it in his piece on There Will Be Blood, is that American film culture needs these auteur heroes. And like since the 70s, they've needed them. And it's maybe not you and I as audience members who need them, but it's definitely critical culture. And he used this phrase to describe PTA where he called them the small white hope, right? And to me, it's turnabout as a very interesting kind of fair play where if you're gonna have this dick swinging virtuosity in all the movies, not just in terms like images of penises, but like the length and duration of the shots and the stamina of the shots, right? Like Anderson is sort of saying like, look at me. I thought it was very interesting that he tried to shrivel them that way. And I think that the discourse is relevant in this case. It's not just joking, it's pretty, bang on in terms of what male auteur film culture and auteur worship is. And in writing a book, how do you avoid just kind of erecting that cathedral? Like, how do you not just do that? Obviously, I like this filmmaker, but you know, you got to do something more than that for 300 pages or it's very boring. Well, that's interesting that that's your take, because to me, that's a part of like a white male guilt like take of, OK, auteurism, I'm the white male. This is I'm dominating the sphere. And in some ways that's true. And in some ways it, it played out in that, like I tweeted about this and you wrote a book about it. You know, we have different <laughs> relationships to criticism and to platforms. And, um, and uh, so that's totally true about the male dominance of auteur culture. But um, I, uh, I mean, and I, I pitched an article and it didn't get taken up. I think in my life as a critic, I've had a really hard time writing about the auteurs, like I'm often getting assigned to like women uh, directors or black directors. And it's very hard for me to get one of these like favorite dudes, but that's, so I was interested in your take on it. I don't quite believe it in the same way that you don't quite believe the Berlatsky about Phantom Thread that we'll get into later. Um, I think it's slightly in bad faith, but interesting or coming from a place of guilt. But for me, it's more interesting in as far as like I find Paul Thomas Anderson one of the few sexy filmmakers. There's like a sexiness to him and to his films that I don't see in a lot of other films um, or filmmakers. I think it's both, but um, I think that, but, and to me, it's also his, what's interesting is his relationship to, um, and this might be my female point of view. I'm really interested in his relationship and like, um, sex and love and romance in his relation in his films and the evolution of that. Um, I think that, you know, I just rewatched Punch Drunk Love for this, which I really liked at the time, but, um, but uh, have thought about one scene in particular for like ever since then, so for the last, whatever, 15 years since it came out, um, the scene where they, um, or longer, the scene when they're in bed and she's, and she, and they said, your face is so cute, I want to smash it in. I want to, your, your nose is so cute, I want to bite it off. And it just gets increasingly violent. And in a way that I found really both romantic and grotesque and interesting, but sort of also sexy. And, um, and there's, and you know the, that's about a lot of awkwardness. There's a scene where the um, phone sex operator is like trying talking to him, and I don't like the way the phone sex operator is handled. And he and she and she's like, "Are you hard?" He's like, I, "I don't know what it's doing right now," <laughs> you know. And so like that's a sort of timidity, and like that's when he goes from sex, which he was all you know, he admits he was a, a he, he he was an obsessive porn watcher, which is why he made Boogie Nights and these sort of thing, to making a film that was about romance. And then, and then I love to have a little biographical reading about his famous girlfriends like Fiona Apple, <laughs> because yeah. like then he made Inherent Vice, which is clearly a film about missing an ex-girlfriend, and yet he cast his wife in it in a role. Um, it's like one of the cheesiest, the, one of the biggest missteps in his film, I think, is when he plays um, 
Maya Rudolph's mother's song, um, uh, Minnie, um, Minnie Ripperton's song in the scene that she's in or right after, which is just like so a sweet gesture. But like, I think it's really interesting that it's in a film about his sort of missing an ex-girlfriend. <laughs> so I, I just am really interested. So for me, he's interested in like, the, I guess whatever I was talking about the evolution of the boner is like this, um, you know, this maturity, this like, but sort of like um, going from separating romance and sex and booking nights and punch truck love to um, a sort of, uh, you know, the, the really interesting, sexy, mature Phantom Thread, which is, um, uh, which is has no sex scenes in it, but yeah. is totally sexy and totally mature and totally about marriage. And I think that that's really fascinating. You know, I just want to say about while we're still talking about dicks, um, Leonardo G Gas Gastel said um, there's a scene which was cut out from There Will Be Blood, There Will Be Blood, in which Plainview was confessing to Henry that his penis doesn't work. I did not know that. That is so too much. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> I cut it out to go from my penis doesn't work to the, like the inflamed money shot. Like, I think it's a little bit much. I'm it's, glad you cut it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the things that Adam brings out in that film as well is how sex is always just kind of on the horizon of it, that it pops up in these ways that really do kind of punch you in the face, like where all of a sudden, you know, in the scene with uh, the baptism scene where he's talking about how Daniel Plainville, Plainview is lusting after women. And you're like, well, wait a second. We never saw any of this. Um, but I wanted to bring in Joe, uh, who I believe has been uh, on the same journey that I've been over the last couple of weeks rewatching all of these films. Uh, and I'm just curious what, what you've learned from that experience. Yeah, we've been on the same journey, but at the same time, I've been rereading all of Martin names as novels so it's been like a real you know kind of like dick slap for a couple of weeks <laughs> I can't believe I just said that all right so hmm my position on the evolving boner of Paul Thomas Anderson is that it is not always the camera um so I love um the idea of the kind of phallic auteurist but for me it's very important that the the concept of the phallus or every time he invokes it over the course of his films, it starts to fragment and to sort of multiply and to become something other than the camera to the extent to which, Adam, I'm not sure I agree that the long stunty shots are always supposed to be a male gaze. I think sometimes they feel like a very, very scrutinizing, unmoving uh, kind of general or imagined gaze, you know, witnessing this, uh, witnessing somebody's masculine sh charade crumble, right? And um, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but I was suddenly so struck between watching that scene, the, the difference between who is looking at the, the leading man while he's being interrogated in this scene versus a kind of parallel scene in Magnolia um, when Tom Cruise is, is like, you know, getting his emotional world exploded on TV. Um, because in that movie with that, we, we have this very kind of legitimized journalist doing the scrutinizing, but in the master that's, uh, you know, the unblinking eye, as you say, is very, very, um, very phallic, uh, but it's not identical with the camera's gaze. So you see what I'm saying? The, maybe the penis becomes a way for him to kind of like, you know, kind of throw his voice or like refract his gaze. Well, I thought, that, I thought that in the master, another scene that I loved, and if the clip wasn't so long, I would have suggested it is in his very suggestive job as a department store photographer, you get those still frames of all these lives that he can't buy into for whatever reason, whether it's coming home from the war or this kind of gothic trauma he has, because he's a damaged character on several fronts. And you see him doing the department store photography, and then there's the shop girl whirling around to the rendition of Get Thee Behind Me Satan, which quite amazingly was commissioned for a movie about a seaman on shore leave in the 1930s, which Anderson's never been asked about before, but it's kind of insanely apt as a soundtrack cut. But the way that he's just kind of mesmerized by her whirling around and she's passing the maternity section and the bridal section and the, the lingerie section, like that's one of the moments in those movies where I thought he synced what, I think you're right, in some of the other films had been an omniscient, Steadicam or an omniscient tracking shot point of view 
directly to desire and to the subjective desire of the character. And one of the reasons I think the master in its way is so rigorous, when it came out, people were like, this movie is quite dispersed and incoherent. And I never agreed with that. I thought the way, not that it blurred just fantasy and reality, but the way it kept going inside his head and indicating a point of view that's not just literal vision, but a point of view of desire or a point of view of wanting. When Philip Seymour Hoffman's whirling around doing the song about chastity, I'll no more go a roving, the same theme as Get Thee Behind Me Satan. It's so interesting that he stands in for the shop girl now, but Freddie is undressing all the women with his eyes, which doesn't uh, delegitimize the fact that there's homoeroticism in the movie. It's just that this guy's constantly got like heterosexual sex on his brain. And I, just, I don't know, there's something about the the consideration and deployment of technique there. It's just not the same in the earlier movies. It's more refined, it's more cerebral, it's, 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 it's finer grained. He hasn't changed as an artist or hasn't changed in his considerations, but just as a way of expressing that with the camera, that's one of the things about the master that just drew me in and, 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 and keeps doing so. I'd love to, I, in reading your book and rewatching the movies, like as a more mature person than I was when I first saw them, I'm really curious about the queer reading of these movies. Like, yeah. is anyone in this group a queer man? I don't think so, right? No, no, there's no gay men here. Okay, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that because I find it, I mean, especially looking again at Boogie Nights and you commented about um, about uh, the the, uh, the master and there will be blood. And you made some interesting comments on it, Adam. Um, about uh, it's a uh, it's interesting. Like if we're talking about the obsession with with you know phallus is like is some of these these queer but not queer in fear of I don't know. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that in his films. There's I do. Qu oh, can I can I quickly go? Um, I have this theory that uh, there's this soft, sort of vulnerable, chaotic desire emanating from Philip Seymour Hoffman in the films of Paul Thomas Anderson that has this intensely destabilizing effect, even when it's very subtle, as in Magnolia, um, of like doing some quite important structural work. To and you know, Boogie Nights is a really good example. Um, so yeah, I haven't really like fleshed out or anything, but that's my theory. I feel like he. He finds it convenient to put it in a character, I think. Well, I was I was looking at Boogie Nights yesterday because it's it, it's coincidental timing, but I'm doing an online course on him for an older audience, which is really interesting because in a way you're looking at Boogie Nights and instead of apologizing for the content, they're saying to me like we were there. You know, this is a group of women in their 60s who, who are watching me talk about the movie. But that scene with Scotty and maybe Miriam or Joe or Alex has some thoughts on it. The scene where Scotty tries to show Dirk his car, right? Like, come see my car. Philip Seymour Hoffman is such an emotionally, not just transparent, like such an emotionally translucent actor. That moment is incredibly powerful and moving to me anyway, but it's an afterthought to the movie, right? Anderson like dramatizes this moment of, uh, of longing and block desire where Dirk is really upset by it. And that's all contextualized too, in a way, by Mark Wahlberg's off-camera misadventures, which are not really redeemable in that, in, that, in that sense. And Hoffman sitting in the car going, I'm such a fucking idiot, I'm such a fucking idiot. It's indelible, like you don't forget it. And it goes on Philip Seymour Hoffman's acting reel. And then the movie never comes back to it because he's amazing at making a side character into a protagonist for three minutes. That's part of Anderson's talent in his ensemble movies, but he's gone. It doesn't mean that it doesn't affect the movie. It doesn't mean that it doesn't inform the rest of the movie, but it's also something that just kind of passes. And it's interesting for me, you know, watching that, that he, he never really comes back to Scotty. He doesn't have to, but he also just chooses not to. Well, but he doesn't only exist in those three minutes. There's like the oh. long buildup of their relationship where that's coming. And then there's the, like, I don't know if it would be related. And this is quite what made me a little uncomfortable that I was looking at is the, um, when, uh, um, when uh, Dirk Diggler is, is desperate later and um, becomes a prostitute yeah. briefly. And then there's the, 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 the gay bashing and all of that kind of stuff. So I, I, I do think it kind of came back, but it's very nervous. And then like the, whatever is going on, it's interesting. Like he's interested in those male relationships, but then it just goes to a really interesting place in the, like the master, I think about their relationship, which I've actually, I have, 
very peculiar <laughs> I have peculiar taste in Paul Thomas Anderson compared to um, a lot of I would I would say especially male critics. Um, I um, the the master I've come to like. Um, I'm not really a fan of There Will Be Blood at all, um, and uh, I, I I I really like. I like a lot of Boogie Nights. I like Inherent Vice. I like Phantom Thread. I mean, I, I'd like to go back to talking to Adam about Phantom Thread since you said it's your favorite, but it's also an outlier of the rest. So I'm I'm really interested in that. But well, do other, but, do, other, do other people have thoughts on Phantom Thread first, or is it a movie Joe or Alex that you have a, a real affinity for? Um, so in some respects, but to me, I was trying to think of who is the the anti Woodcock of the Paul Thomas Anderson universe. And first I was thinking Philip Seymour Hoffman and his general amorphous recurring characters. But then I thought it's totally uh, William H. Macy, um, especially, you know, in his character in Magnolia, again, like a yearning, unfulfilled gay man. And there's something definitely chaotic about uh, queer desire, I think, that links a lot to like, like, mother-child relationships, that kind of lack of fulfillment, that kind of, it just uh, like hops from character to character in Boogie Nights, you know, that, that sense of thwarted destiny. Um, and so to me, there are ways in which kind of, I was just thinking, you know, what can you kind of imagine William H. Macy and, and Daniel Day-Lewis together? And then I was thinking, what about, what about uh, Tom Cruise and Daniel Day-Lewis together playing brothers with Joaquin Phoenix? There are all of these, um, these actors take on these straight, their own weird agency within the Paul Thomas Anderson universe in a way that I don't really understand. But Daniel Day-Lewis is a very good example. And so that to me is my, uh, over to you and Phantom Thread. <laughs> well, it, compared, to, oh, if I could just comment quickly on the actor pairing, what's so interesting in Phantom Thread is, I mean, that's also something like, I'm not that, in, I mean, if I don't like, uh, if I don't like There Will Be Blood, I don't necessarily, I'm not, I'm, it's hard for me to get on board with Daniel Day-Lewis sometimes. I think he tends to overact a lot. And my favorite performance of his is probably in Room with a View, where it's completely comic and ridiculous. And I feel like he kind of, I mean, it's, it's comic in There Will Be Blood, but it's especially comic, I think, in Phantom Threat. But what's nice is like his like arch overacting really is balanced by um, Vicky Cripps. And I think that uh, that's really nice. And I think that that's where Paul Thomas Anderson is at in his career with this certain of um, spontaneity and uh, more casualness with this like, as you said, virtuosity that you see in Daniel Day-Lewis's performance, and I think slight hamminess. There's there's a line that I think Adam has in the book about how uh, a lot of the films, and I think in Phantom Thread in particular, represent, I think he says, a game of chicken between satire and severity, and that uh, the thing I admire the most about Phantom Thread is that it's, it's both comic and deeply moving. The first time I saw it, I had like, uh, a, like profound spiritual experience in the scene where you know Daniel Dalis is very sick and his mother is haunting him and that is also essentially a joke too where it allows you know it's the thing that frees him to uh to marry Vicky Creeps because she reminds him of mom you know too um and and I think in other places too that's maybe less successful that you know and there will be blood, the comic moments, I think sometimes overwhelm some of the other things, but, but yeah. yeah at, but Joe, that... Joe made a really smart point about mothers in the work because fathers is often what people lead with and it's not not true, right? But a movie like Boogie Nights, maybe one of the embarrassing moments in that or one of the moments that feels like a pretty young filmmakers, you know, him telling his mom off and there being no signal in the movie that he's wrong to do so, right? I mean, she's played in a very kind of over the top way that almost seems to invite that tirade. But you know, when you look at a movie like There Will Be Blood, that's a movie of complete female absence. And The Master is a movie where women are on the periphery. They're really just kind of how Freddie sees them. I mean, Inherent Vice, Miriam, I think is exactly right about what that movie is about, even more than the novel, it's about missing an ex. And uh, so what I'm interested in Phantom Thread and what I tried out in the book was the idea that after never really attempting explicitly female subjectivity before, he pulls an interesting trick in Phantom Thread and you really have to pay attention, 
we are only ever seeing Reynolds through her. Even the opening really gives you a sense that this is about him and his house because it's fetishistically designed around Daniel Day-Lewis and his ablutions and you see him in this position of authority and it's the rhythm and routine of his life with this revolving door of girlfriends and his sister is his kind of major domo. But it begins with Alma saying he's the most demanding man and I've given him every part of myself and this is how I see him. And there's a presumption to the way the movie is structured that this alpha male filmmaker is going to attempt not a female character, but God forbid, a female point of view in the movie. And some critics took it to task for that and others kind of took it at face value as being very effective. I would agree with Miriam that what makes it work much more than Daniel Day-Lewis is Vicky Krebs. And her interview in the book is the only one of the interviews I did that I found personally validating, both in the sense that she's such a sweet person, but the way that she talked about the performance lined up really nicely, not just with questions, but with how I felt about the movie. And some of it, again, to Miriam's point, is spontaneity. She is an author of that performance to a big extent. And it's not about giving or taking credit away, but let's say Paul Thomas Anderson gets plenty of credit, you know? He has three names. Guys with three names get lots of credit for things. There's a whole extra name there. You know, Vicky Krieps made that part. And that rhythm in the movie of Alma always getting the last word, that's hers. And that's the single funniest thing in the movie to me, is the way that the conversations never end. You know, maybe I don't like your taste. Maybe you have no taste. Maybe I have my own taste. That's her. And I just think it's so, as Alex was saying, comic in a way that I think renders the severity a bit of a, a bit of a fake out. I think it's a sweet, funny movie. That's very screwball, that dynamic you just talked about, the yeah. never ending dialogue and the sort yeah. of build up on each other. It's very screwball comedy. But I would argue with you that that a female uh, point of view came just the film before, because he made a major change from the book yeah. by having Sortilege, how do you say her name? I should know that. Sortilege, Sortilege, yeah. Sortilege, yeah. So he had, um, um, uh, um, uh, oh my God, I've just forgotten. Joanna, New Joanna Newsom. Joanna Newsom, the musician um, that uh, uh, voiced that, which I think really changes everything about that film, having her voice it. This is true. Um, yeah. I. I have a couple of things I'd like to talk to you about that. While we're talking, I have, I have a couple of points I'd like to get off. One is when we're talking about um, Joanna Newsom, um, I think I've thought a lot about why Inherent Vice um, I think is so successful. And I just tried watching it again before this, you, to prepare for this talk, but I've seen it like, uh, like definitely double digits. I'm not sure how many times I've seen this film. I, and the thing is my relationship with this film is like an album. Like I can just put it on and just kind of get into the rhythms. And I love that. And I think that's so different than his other films, which Adam speaks, Adam writes so eloquently about the intentional and jagged and sort of overly intentional rhythms of his other films. And this one is so much more relaxed, but it's also like, to me, um, yeah, like an album. And I, I have a feeling that Paul Thomas Anderson is like a frustrated musician, like his relationship with music, with like working with musicians. Like, I think there are certain filmmakers that are like that. Um, Sean Price Williams, another three name, Josh Safdie. There are certain filmmakers that are frustrated musicians. And I feel like in working with musician, Joanna Newsom and, you know, having, he's so interested in voices. And I, 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 I think that's part of his interest in score and his interest in soundtrack and is interested just in the voice. That's what I think I enjoy the most about There Will Be Blood is um, the blood. dueling voices. Um, so I don't know, any comments on Inherent Vice as an album? Well, I thought it, I liked the idea of it in, as an album quite a bit. I also think it it points to the the way that Adam structures the book, which is uh, something that I had not thought about Anderson as at all, which is as a historical filmmaker. And that uh, the thing I always think about watching Inherent Vice, and I'm also probably a double digit watcher, is uh, that this is a movie that is about our relationship to the 1960s, both uh, as a kind of simultaneously is very nostalgic for this moment sort of right after the quote unquote 60s uh, have ended, but is also about interrogating that, that nostalgia. So he has these uh, wonderful moments that 
you know, are the way I imagine the whatever LA, the aftermath of the LA psychedelic rock scene. You know, you can imagine members of love hanging out of these these things. But but like Pynchon's novel, it's also, I think, uh, very critical about a culture that fetishizes this this era. Yeah, uh, Joe, did you do did you, did you have thought or? Oh, I've got so much to say about Inherent Vice. <laughs> Firstly, I watched it like five, I watched it like maybe two or three times and each time forgot that I'd seen it because I was so stoned when I watched it. And then like, and then it turned out that there isn't really like a plot to remember. There's just like, you know, like girl, like goes away, comes back and I'm like, yeah, yeah, cool. Okay, I get it, I get it. But um, what I love about that film or what it makes it feel album-like to me is the way that it's like a series of kind of vignettes stitched together through like the, you know, investigative protagonist but they're all like human stories p patched together through relationships, which is the total opposite of a film. Like, I'm just gonna keep shitting on Magnolia because I find it like a, a good counter example often because yeah. Magnolia is all about coincidences and things just, just that just happen to have happened, right? These things happen or whatever, like the last um, bit is, but to me, like coincidence, happenstance, contingency is very important in the Paul Thomas Anderson universe, but then also the kind of uh, force that acts against us of, of free will and decision making and, and human beings. And I like an inherent vice, how he lets himself get lost in the texture of relationships and just kind of like leaves the, the plot as a, you know, drifting woman. Why, I'm, I, I've absolutely, and the, the theme of inherent vice or the meaning of it you know, that belongs to Pynchon, but the way that the movie inhabits and embodies that theme of the center can't hold and things don't last. And, you know, I mean, not to get pretentious about it, but just the idea of mortality or shelf life really for anything, whether it's relationship or ideals or a person is something that has a subtlety that a movie like Magnolia, um, you know, it, it's not there. I mean, my, my take on Magnolia, whether I'm right or not, is that it's all about imminence. It's a it's a Y2K movie, not in intention or even in execution, but just in when it came out. And it feels like there's a timer on him too, where it's like, I gotta get everything I'm ever gonna get into a movie in this movie, because this was the big final cut movie. There's something about Inherent Vice, it's not a relaxed movie, it's a sad movie, or I find it a sad movie, I find it achingly sad. But there's a relaxed mastery to the way it's made, where he's not jamming things into scenes, if anything, he's pulling things out of scenes. He's trusting things like absence, he's trusting things like ephemera to really kind of carry the movie. There was a line that Kent Jones had when he reviewed Magnolia, which was not a nice line, back in 99 where he says this guy knows how the surfaces of movie feels but he's not so good about infrastructures why i personally love the master and inherent vice is that these are extremely infrastructural movies but they don't act like it they give the impression of disorder or they give a really really good impression of aimlessness but they're not and I think in time with enough viewings of Inherent Vice, I could see myself getting to a place where, where Miriam's at or where Joe's talking about where it becomes one of my absolute favorite of his movies. I'm not there, but I'm gonna keep re-watching it. Interestingly, I had not watched There Will Be Blood for about six years before I started writing the book, which doesn't mean that I don't like it, but it, it kind of gives you everything all at once. It's spectacular maybe to a fault. Absolutely. I, I think your criticisms of the book are great. I do have one correction in the book. I think that you said that the house that is at the end where um, where he lives, where Plainview lives, um, was the same house that was owned by um, Doheny? Doheny? Doheny. Yeah, the, the oil baron that his character is based on. It actually wasn't his house. It was his son's house. And I think there was actually a famous queer murder that happened there later. Um, but it, so it wasn't the person who was modeled after his son had a different life, but what it was, which is, it was the AFI house in the seven, it was AFI seventies yeah, and eighties. It was like where all those seventies guys were. But, um, I would just want to, uh, just swing back to something Alex said, and then actually Joe, but what Alex said about the historical is absolutely true. And I think, as I mentioned, when we were prepping for this, I think it's not just about America. I think it's very specifically until Phantom Thread, his films are all about California. And as a Californian, I absolutely love that. And in, um, and you know, his early films are just, they take place in California. They're very local. They're very, um, you know, about that history, about, uh, about 
um, show business as a part of life and all of these kind of things. But I think he did make that switch in last decade. Um, and it's interesting because what those films, There Will Be Blood, which is clearly about um, you know, how oil informed, um, and trains, how oil and train monopolies informed California history. And then you go, as Adam says in his book, right into, um, you know, the, from one sort of religious cult leader to a different kind of religious cult leader, um, in a different era and like Scientology, which is so important in, um, America. Another, I think, personal biographical connection. I'll talk about it later, but I realized like, um, Jeremy Blake, who worked on Punch Drunk Love, ended up dying in a really tragic way because of like Scientology paranoia, like basically. Um, and I think I wonder how much that informed that. But just going back to the California history, the those two, um, his his all of his films, but especially those two, there will be blood and um, well and inherent bias, all three and um, the master remind me of. Um, uh, where I was from, the Joan Didion book, and I wonder, I wonder if wrestling with that became of interest of him because I think that came out in two thousand three, and you know it's something that Adam had said it's not just about the mythology, but like you know working against the mythology, and she makes some really interesting, um, like she it's I, I I don't know have you have you guys have you all read that book? Yeah, quickly I just want to jump in and say that we'll be going to Q and A in about five or 10 minutes. So if you have any questions, get them in now. Um, but yeah, to go to Miriam's point, uh, I think that, I mean, there's a, there's a California real estate dimension alone just in these films. Uh, it's, not, it's not quite the James Joyce Dublin, but it's, a, it's an interesting mix of history and mythology. And I was wondering if Adam could talk about that particularly as a non-Californian. Well, I, one of the things I like about Inherent Vice is that Doc is a mobile character and he has access to different parts of the city in a way that Sandler's character doesn't really in Punch Drunk Love. He's static, even though he's physically kind of all over the place. And Magnolia literally takes place on a street, right? I mean, I'm exaggerating, but the whole point is that it's, you know, a, a self-contained neighborhood. And Heron Vice has mobility in history and also mobility geographically. And I think the fact that Doc is welcome or at least can get to all these different places is kind of why he's a cool detective and also why he's an interesting kind of tour guide surrogate character for that. I mean, the part that I connect most strongly to, and I mean, Didion's a good reference for it, and some of the reading I did for the book were the actual Scientology texts or the biographies of Hubbard, is just that fine line between show business and, you know, the selling of, of the, and the showmanship of religion, right? And just selling in general, an entrepreneurial uh, endeavor as a theme in his work is really interesting. There's a really withering essay on Anderson by a really good film critic named Nick Pinkerton, and it's not withering out of proportion. It's critical the way good writing should be. And he uses Anderson's biography as being born literally in Studio City as a sort of very Los Angeles plays itself, Tom Anderson met at him for the ultimate conventionality of his work, that he's a pure product of Hollywood in his way, even though the films exist seen as art house or auteur or kind of, you know, to the side of whatever else. And it's interesting because Anderson's biography is not disguised in those early movies. Magnolia is about TV, which is his dad and his family and kind of what he grew up in. But that has started to recede as a lens to look at the movies through, even to look at the Los Angelesness of the movies through. That's really not what's happening in The Master and, and in Hair and Vice as much. So it's a change. Uh, but if you look at the early discourse on Anderson, man, it's all about TV in Los Angeles. That's what all the academic writing up to about 2000 is about. You can't get away from it. There's something, um, sorry, do you mind if no, I go, with Miriam? Thanks. Um, this, God, how, how do I phrase this? Um, Miriam, you go, I'm going to reformulate my thought. <laughs> well, mine is a segue. Um, so you go first. Are you ready? No, no, because now I'm thinking I'm wrong. Okay, well, it's, it's, it's about something you said. So maybe this will okay. spark another comment too. But it was, I just want to say like, you know, I wasn't that into the master when I first saw it, but um, I've, I came to appreciate it. But I had a really interesting first experience seeing the master. I saw it, they were doing some 70 millimeter screenings around New York when I lived there. And I went to a screening at the Museum of Moving Image and um, Paul Thomas Anderson was there. And, um, you know, I saw the film, it's this, you know, uh, 
this sort of classical serious score and this drama and like there was one person in the audience just cracking up and it was Paul Thomas Anderson and he was laughing at his own jokes like so much and like especially that I'm a writer a doctor a nuclear physicist but other parts too and I really oh would God. like to like Josephine, about, I'd like to ask Joe about that, but also um, Adam, because I love the way you write on comedy and even, and um, and uh, Adam and I did a live tweet of The Happening once uh, and <laughs> a film that we both find hilarious. Start, maybe. Starting, starting Dirk Diggler, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But I'd love to hear both Joe and Adam talk about the that line of the comedy within his, in his work. Okay, so it's Joe, you've I remember what I was going to say before, which does yeah. relate to the comedy, that there's something, okay, I don't know if I'm going to express this properly, but there's something aggressively neutral about Paul Thomas Anderson's taste in music, <laughs> in composition, in characterization, in terms of what, everything he finds interesting. There's something so bang on what, like, people who think they're smart think is good that it becomes invisible. I'm talking about, like, Inherent Vice, the soundtrack, right? Like Yola Tango is in there. Like, it's some, this is like strange anachronistic choices. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But yeah, Yola Tango is a good example. And like his interest, just like his music choices, there's something, do you understand what I'm saying about the aggressive neutrality, the almost trendiness? There's something so of our time about Paul Solm Sanderson that it's very, very difficult to like get a, a granular grip on. It's extremely Gen X though too. Like, I think it's very Gen X in its way. Like, yeah. that, sort of that coolness and hipness and like... Right, it's like just a second ago. It's not long enough ago to be able to describe properly to me. Maybe it's... Maybe it's... I mean, it, it's an interesting point because he's not shy about displaying his tastes and maybe he displays them in a way where we should kind of be more beguiled or bewildered by them. They're kind of just kind of down he's, the line. Right, he's doing of... it way more subtly than like the Cohen brothers, you know, or like Wes Anderson. It's not like, um, oh, look at my playlist. It's like, oh, the next day, maybe you're going to remember how great my playlist was. It's like a different kind of masculine um, display. But but to, 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 to comedy and Miriam's point, I mean, and we're circling kind of back to the master maybe before we start taking questions, because I know we have to um, let other people ask stuff. That scene in the master where he's being queried by uh, John Moore, the, the 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 rationalist who's like you know i don't see how time travel hypnosis therapy is going to cure leukemia the scene is hilarious and it's hilarious yeah, the, the, heckler. The, the heckling scene and it's funny because it's all about what happens when someone is challenged on their premises to the point where they just have nothing to say and they just explode which is the voluble volatile thing that a lot of anderson's movies have and it's screwball a man a man not a person a man yeah a man. yeah a man sure uh, and in this <laughs> case a master in every sense of the word, someone who believes he has knowledge and authority and ownership and dominance. And he just has nothing better to say than kind of pick fuck, pick which is funny because of Hoffman's reading, but it's a very acute scene in terms of how authority when challenged kind of comes unruffled. And it has a screwball thing that's not romantic back and forth screwball, but again, it's the velocity of the dialogue creates the effect and creates the impact. And I don't know if I would say I would, uh, this first time I saw, saw the master, I was sitting there laughing. And if I was, they weren't at my own jokes, but it, I think it's a hilariously funny movie. I just think that like Inherent Vice and like Phantom Thread, it's capacious enough where you don't have to choose. And I can only speak for my own taste, but it's those movies that don't force you to choose their tone uh, that are not sloppy, they're spacious and they're thoughtful, which for me is a, is, is the master is the ape, uh, an apex of that tendency for him. I think I get, I, I agree totally, but I also want to agree with, I, I see what you mean, Joe, as far as that quality and how he's evolved, you know, that laughing at your own jokes. And I think that's how he's evolved. Not only maybe laughing, I think he's probably still laughing at jokes. He's so funny that he's I think that, you know, his relationship with comedy is really interesting, but I think that he stopped writing jokes and that's made him a better filmmaker. Like, I think like early on, he wrote these like, you know, like, oh, do, are you gonna, you know, these these really deliberate lines about nothing, like in Booking Nights and these sort of, they're supposed to be funny, ha ha. And like, and then maybe in The Master, it's more tone, but he's still laughing at his own jokes. But when you get to Inherent Vice, he's um, find a way to be comedic and as Adam said, spacious without um, without necessarily having jokes that 
he's cracking him, himself up. Uh, he's up about. Uh, I guess I'll move to Q and A. Um, Austin Abbott has a question, which is something that I've been wondering about as well, which is, uh, have you seen any influence from Paul Thomas Anderson, either positive or negative on the generation of filmmakers that have started to make work after him? I mean, it's, a, it, 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 it's it, everyone's gonna have a subjective answer to that. And even as he reaches whatever age he's at, it's hard not to see him more as the sum of his own influences, because that's what so much of the discourse around him is. Like, I still don't think we're past thinking of him in terms of like Altman and Scorsese and this big mythic thing of the, of the 70s. So I'll kind of punt on this, except to answer the question to say, I think he's had a huge impact on critical discourse. And I'm not going to say whether it's a positive or negative impact. It's just a, it, it's an impact around the way people write about authorship and the way people write about mastery in American movies. I think that has crystallized around him more than anyone else in his cohort. Uh, Dylan has a question, which is just to ask about uh, our thoughts on race and representation in Paul Thomas Anderson's work and how we think this might evolve in the future, uh, mentioning that Anderson has discussed working with Tiffany Haddish. Uh, and are there any hopes or ideas about how his new coming of age movie set, I believe in the 1970s in Los Angeles, uh, which I presume will be autobiographical, uh, if, if that will evolve uh, at this point at all? As a black person, can I say, it's not something that I've really thought about very often in his movies. Um, and uh, and I don't think it necessarily needs to be there, but again, biographically married, like having an obvious thing for mixed race women and being married to a mixed race woman. I do wonder if he'll tackle it in different ways, like maybe with this project with his wife and with Tiffany Haddish, I think he needs to, which would be even better as a chance for him to get deeper into comedy, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I, I agree with Iman. I'm black, I don't need PTA to fumble about my representation. White people can stay in white business, let him fund black creators. Totally agree. Miriam, can you talk a little bit about that um, kind of disaster scene of wife as receptionist with the Aryan Brotherhood going in and out and, and just how you thought that was a total flunker? No, I just think that I don't think it's a clunker. I think it's just sentiment. I think it's, I think it's, I don't right, think it's okay. a clunker. I just think, I think having his wife is there. I think that the music cue is sentimental because he puts in right after that scene, he puts in the song, um, uh, a song by Maya Rudolph's mother, right. Ripperton, Ripperton. which I think is just like a sentimental move, which is, I think he normally wouldn't do, which I find sweet, but I don't think necessarily I think it's, it kind of totally takes me out of the film. But no, the white Aryan stuff, I, lo I love all that stuff. It's totally California history, man. It's like so honestly, true, all of that stuff. That moment when, uh, you know, explaining, oh, actually it's a symbol of uh, peace and togetherness. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly California history. Perfect. There are so many really good books about the Nazi, uh, the relationship of Nazis and flower children and hippies like, um, yeah, books I can recommend. This is something that I have had a long interest in. And so I think that the, the movie doesn't get anywhere with it. It just sort of brings it all up, real estate mm. and all of this stuff is like paranoia, but it's completely right. Uh, one, one question that uh, Eric Leffler had was, if anyone here sees a, a difference between Paul Thomas Anderson's original screenplays and uh, and his adaptations. I mean, it's interesting because the only adaptation with much fidelity to the source text is Inherent Vice. And there's a lot of invention over and on top of the book, particularly each of the last two scenes, which are kind of crucial to the movie's power is the last encounter with Bigfoot and um, Shasta being in the car with him, which are kind of both his additions. But there's not a ton of Upton Sinclair in There Will Be Blood, right? So it's not, maybe I wouldn't so much compare the adaptations to the original scripts as to say whether he's writing whole cloth or writing under influence or writing from a book. He's always kind of, for better or worse, writing himself. The only one of his scripts I ever read him talk about in great detail was Magnolia, which to Joe's point, he has a good line that I quote in the book where he says, this was written without a delete button. <laughs> and I'm like, better or worse, love it or hate it. It's my least favorite of his movies. That's a really good description of Magnolia. There are no darlings killed in that movie. 
And I think that in, in Inherent Vice, what you have is a bit like the Coens with No Country where he's not just adapting a good book, you can feel the respect for the book and how the filmmaker who's very, has a big personality filters that respect through their own sense of ownership and authorship is I think interesting. But I wouldn't say it's either or better or worse. It's, it's different. When I can first I jump saw in there really work... quickly with that, yeah. Oh, Joe. sorry, Alex, we can go um, after this go, is another question. It. Is that okay if I pick it out with the Q&A? There's one yeah. from Kathleen Carney asking, is he a comic filmmaker or an absurdist? He seems to be an existentialist, which I think connects to that, those, that difference between Magnolia's uh, overabundance of schlock deri or gloopiness derived from coincidence, which is like, the existentialist like concept, but it's not very cinematic. I think, <laughs> or like it's too cinematic somehow. It's just, it just doesn't work properly, and it's not working towards an absurd position, which is what works for him. I think the absurd. I don't know. What yeah, do I mean, I found myself with Magnolia on this watch for the first time having a like genuinely emotional response to it, and yet I also can't help but view it autobiographically in a way that I think diminishes from it, or at least in a way that I can feel the amount of cocaine that Paul Thomas Anderson is on while writing this script. And that like you feel his anxiety about being a like anointed filmmaker, right? You feel his anxiety about will he die alone uh, in a way that I think is sort of transfixing, but not always compelling to me. Um, well, that complicated. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Should we pick another one out of the queue, Alex? Or? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, second. Uh, <laughs> um, one question I think we've talked a little bit about Joanna Newsom's character uh, in Inherent Vice and Vicky Creeps' character in Phantom Thread. Uh, anonymous attendee asks, how Amy Adams's character in The Master uh, fits into the, po the power dynamics of Anderson's female characters in his later films. Anyone else wanna say something? The I real can master. Them, but I'm happy to wait. So. <laughs> no, the real wanted... master, the like genius Dom. I just want to the great dick scene, the great. Sorry. Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> <That's something>. Yeah. <laughs> but I would also say that if you look at the casting of the women in The Master, they are all shades of Doris. Funniest shot in that movie is how his teen lover Doris is nine feet tall on the bench while he's sitting in his shriveled little sailor suit in his memory. It's a subjective memory, but she looms physically large in the shot. I mean, she towers over Joaquin Phoenix in that shot. It's a, it's a perspective shot. And Amy Adams and the shop girl and even the woman at the end, Wynne Manchester, all have the same physical traits, you know, and Amy Adams is right in pocket with that. They're all redheads. They're kind of taller than he is, although Amy Adams is sort of small. Like the masters of the movie, where I think the female characters are all refracted from some, through some prism of whatever it is that Freddie wants or what Paul Thomas Anderson wants, because Vicky Kreeps is very similar physically to that in, in, in Inherent Vice too. But yeah, as, I mean, is, is, is Peggy the power behind the throne? Sure, sure, sure could be read that way. He films her standing behind him a lot standing behind him on stage and also standing behind him with the hand job scene in the in the bathroom mirror and she's the one with the actual talent for eye contact in real life you notice that like she quite rarely blinks and she holds people's gazes and yep. she's like this kind of impenetrable barrier and he in real life is not actually that good at it he's like a bit um you know a bit flinchy well and she, she's incredible and she meets freddie's gaze when freddie is watching dodd sing i'll no more go a roving that whole shot is designed where she's sitting naked and pregnant, first of all. No one else sees him looking at them, and she does, which is really haunting. If you look for it in the shot, it's a wonderful little eyeline match cue with, uh, with Amy Adams. Uh, maybe we can do this as a lightning round just to end things. Uh, another anonymous attendee asks if we have a favorite performance, maybe accepting uh, Daniel Day-Lewis uh, and Philip Seymour Hoffman. Performer or performance? Performance. Okay. I'm just gonna Would you rather we could change it. This is probably not true, but right now I just want to say Mark Wahlberg can be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that's so good. I will second that by saying Julianne Moore in Boogie Nights. 
opposite Mark Wahlberg as the, the ultimate pure mother-son relationship. Having, having just watched a not very successful new version of Rebecca, I will give it to Leslie Manville for her superb Mrs. Danvers riff in Phantom Thread. Someone, I think Cam Collins wrote at that time, like, it's so thrilling when an actor shows you a character thinking and Leslie Manville is incredible at that particular skill in, in Phantom Thread. She's brilliant. And if the Oscars I, meant anything, she, she'd have won. I selected this because I thought I had the perfect answer, which was Leslie Manville. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, but, but on that note, uh, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us. Uh, this has been really one of the highlights of uh, the last year uh, for me. It's been wonderful to talk to such uh, smart and uh, funny people. Um, and it's nice to see my colleague Joe again, but I cannot uh, recommend purchasing this book uh, strongly enough. It's really Look how big it is. It's such good value for money. And I can attest quite heavy. Yeah. <laughs> um, appreciate it. It's, yeah. Uh, this has been wonderful. I just want to thank everyone uh, for joining. And if you go to newrepublic.com, you can see uh, future events, including a discussion between Laura Marsh and Jonathan Lethem, which I believe will be happening next month. Thank you so much. It was really Thank fun. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank this you. was super fun.